I don't do it for the money. The money is going to come. I do it because of the love that I have for it. You know what I'm saying? If I was a plumber or something like that, I still would make hip hop records. That's how much love I have for it. You know, I feel like right now I've been in the game close to 27 years and I've actually thought about this just recently. Out of the entire 27, my 27 year career, there's only been two weeks that I've been out of the studio. There's, mm. I've never been out of the studio longer than two weeks in my entire career. That's how much love I have for this thing that I do, this thing that I do, this thing that I do, this thing that I do. Hoi my people, yes 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 I'm in an especially good mood this time around because it's Aquarius season so it's only right that I make a video on my birthday twin and the guy who just won the Global Impact Award at the 2023 Grammys just a few weeks ago, the legendary Dr Dre. I'll be covering his early days from the world class wrecking crew slash NWA all the way to where he is now and the impact of his work. This documentary will make you understand why Dr. Dre is so important to the music on a global level, but especially in the West Coast. This guy literally brought a whole coast to the forefront and revived it after its decline. You guys should know the drill by now. Like, share, comment and subscribe to get more videos. So without any further ado, Throwback Central presents Dr. Dre, The West Coast Heartbeat. Let's, let's get it, get it, get it. Get it. Dr. Dre was born Andre Ramel Young on the 18th of February 1965 in Compton, California to Theodore and Werner Young, just two weeks after his mother's 16th birthday. His parents married a year before Andre was born and divorced in 1972 when Dre was only 7 years old. According to Dr. Dre, his father was smart but he was crazy too, physically and verbally abusive towards his mother. Now this particular piece of information is key and will make sense later on. You guys probably already know where I'm going with this. His mom later remarried and had three children, one of which was Tyree, whom looked up to Dr. Dre and followed him everywhere. His mother tried her best in succeeding in shielding Dre from the dangerous city outside their household. In the 1950s, Compton was nearly an all-white city, but by the 1970s, a lot of blacks began moving in, in part due to a state-sanctioned predatory real estate practice called blockbusting thus causing them racist white people to move out. By the mid 70s, Compton would have gangs, drug beefs and increasing crime rates as a result of poverty. Dr. Dre recalls his mother telling him that people who joined gangs were usually cowards and misguided children, which played a major part in Dr. Dre staying away from gangs. At a young age, Dr. Dre would spend most of his time listening to music, especially George Clinton, Booty Collins, Quincy Jones, Isaac Hayes, amongst many others, sparking his interest in music. He was given a mixer as a Christmas present and started making tapes and DJing at his mother's house parties. As much as he liked music, his mother would be on his case about getting a serious job and becoming somebody in life. Mostly due to a lot of people saying that because she had a baby at 16, she and her kids wouldn't amount to much. So Verna used that as a motivation to make sure that she and her son would become somebody. In her eyes, music was just a waste of time. <sighs> Man, I feel for younger Dre, man, because listen, I feel like a lot of musicians went through this stage at some point in their lives and people really need to start acknowledging the fact that music is a real job and people don't see the amount of work and effort that goes behind working on your craft. The only downside to music is that it's a literal grind, so it's not easy at all. Anyways, I digress. Many friends recall Dr. Dre as being extremely shy and letting his mixes speak for him. His talent would soon pay off and by 1983 he would start DJing at a local nightclub called Eve After Dark. At this nightclub is where he would meet future band member DJ Yella and the two would form a friendship and eventually record demos together. 
In their first recording session, they would record a song called Surgery. The owner of Eve After Dark, Alonzo Williams, would like the track and invite Dr. Dre and DJ Yella to join his group and re-record the track with them. And that would be Dre's introduction to the music industry. In 1984, the world-class wrecking crew would release singles Slice and Surgery, the latter of which would be the breakout song for the group. Dr. Dre now looks back at the song and calls it the most corniest thing he was ever a part of. And to be honest, I agree. I mean, calling Dr. Dre to surgery. Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre, 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 Dre. I mean, the song was bad, even for its time, but what can I say, man? The AEs gave us great and bad music, just like any other decade. Anyways, in 1987, Dr. Dre would meet R&B singer Michelle, who was brought in to sing in the featured vocals on the song uh, Turn Off The Light, in replacement of another singer who couldn't make it to the studio that day. With Dre coaching her in the sessions, the two would hit it off and start an on and off relationship. Surgery provided Dr. Dre with his first taste of success, but he would soon get frustrated because he didn't have a lot of say and creative control in how the music was supposed to be, leading him to get tired of the leather jackets, clean image and makeup vibe they had going on. He would soon have desires of starting his own record label, or maybe being part of a label that would allow him to make music his own way, and this is where his childhood friend Easy e came in. In 1986, Dr. Dre would reach out to Easy e who also lived in the same neighborhood as Dre, with an idea to start their own label because Easy e had the funds to make it happen. Easy e was a known local dealer in the streets, so he had a constant source of income if you will. Easy e also used to attend Eve After Dark on some nights to watch his friend Dre perform his DJ sets, so the two already had a musical connection in some way. Easy e would agree to provide Dr. Dre the capital for the new venture and Ruthless Records was now a label. Dr. Dre would bring in a 16 year old Ice Cube to write Boys in the Hood for a rap group from New York, Homeboys Only, HBO. But when the group rejected the song, the label was left with no other person to rap the song. Ice Cube couldn't rap the song because he was already in another group called CIA and he was just brought in as a ghostwriter. So Dr. Dre encouraged Easy e to rap it himself. Easy e was initially skeptical and declined as he wanted to be the businessman working behind the scenes. But after a bit of encouragement, Easy agreed to rap after being coached by Dr. Dre and recording each verse line by line. The session took hours and a lot of patience by Dr. Dre, but when the final product came out, Boys in the Hood was a hit and Easy was officially a rapper, thus putting Ruthless Records on the map. The song would quickly pick up in the streets and end up on radio. That's when manager Jerry Heller approached Easy E about becoming his manager for him and NWA. According to Jerry Heller, he had always told Easy that he worked for them and that Ruthless was an 80-20 partnership between himself and Easy, with Easy taking home 80% and Jerry taking 20% of the profits. Jerry Heller reportedly invested $1 million to get the Ruthless label off the ground and really make it a legit business. Although Jerry was best known for his management of NWA, he actually already had prior experience in the field and rose to prominence in the 1960s and 70s, representing the likes of Marvin Gaye, Ike and Tina Turner, Otis Redding, The Who and The Grassroots among many others. Shortly after, Jerry Heller began to shop around different major labels in order to get Easy e and NWA a distribution deal with a lot of people rejecting due to the explicit and aggressive nature of the tracks. By this point, the group only had one compilation album out, which was N.W.A. and The Posse, which featured original member Arabian Prince and the single Boys in the Hood. Eventually, Brian Turner of Priority Records would express his interest in adding N.W.A. to its roster, and the group quickly began to work on their debut album, which became Straight Outta Compton. Released in August of 1988, the album went gold and peaked at number 9 on the Billboard's top R&B and Hip Hop Albums chart, and at number 37 on the Billboard 200. 
The year after, in 1989, the album would be certified platinum. The album spawned singles Straight Outta Compton, Gangsta Gangsta and Express Yourself. Although not a single, the album also contained the infamous or famous controversial protest record F The Police, which protested police brutality and racial profiling. The song provoked the FBI to write to NWA's record company about the lyrics expressing disapproval and arguing that the song misrepresented the police. At one of their shows on tour in Detroit, the police warned NWA to refrain from performing the song F The Police and the failure to do so would result in immediate arrest. NWA went on to perform the song anyway, thus prompting the police to arrest them. This was also depicted in the 2015 hit movie Straight Outta Compton, with the only difference being that in real life the group was arrested back at their hotel and not at the venue. In 1989, Dr. Dre and Yella also produced Michelet's debut self-titled album, which spawned singles No More Lies, Nice Tea and Keep Watching, all bangers by the way. Michelet can really sing and she's underrated as a singer in my opinion. Around this time, the relationship between Dr. Dre and Michelet would turn violent as Dre would get physically abusive towards her. Her injuries included a broken nose, which she had to have surgically corrected, a cracked rib and five black eyes. In some instances, she would have to cover up their black eyes for video shoots and interviews, sometimes still being visible like in this video right here. <sighs> Damn Dre. Michelle should have left him by now, but she wouldn't leave him until the mid 90s, well after they had a child together. And I don't understand for the life of me what would drive a guy to beat up his girl like that much as well. There's no way you love someone and you hurt them that way. <laughs> Thin line between love and hate ladies and gentlemen. In that same year, Dr. Dre would suffer a major loss in the family when on the 25th of June 1989, he would receive a call while on tour when his mom informed him that his little brother Tyree was killed in a fight back in Compton. Someone had pushed him and he fell hard, breaking his neck. Dr. Dre fell into a depression and had missed one show to attend his brother's funeral. After the funeral, he decided to return on tour, but the rest of NWA noticed a change in Dre. He had begun drinking and he wasn't as charismatic anymore. He partially blamed himself for his brother's death, as he felt that had he brought Tyree on tour with him like he wanted to, Tyree would still be alive and away from the dangerous streets of Compton. In addition to Tyree, Dre and NWA as a whole would soon suffer yet another major loss. This is where things began to slowly crumble for NWA. Shortly after their tour, Ice Cube, an essential member of the group, would leave NWA due to him feeling like Jerry Heller was not paying them fairly and suspecting a case of favoritism from Jerry towards Easy e By this point, Ice Cube was the only smart member that did not sign the contract just because $75,000 was dangled in front of him, so he was free to leave. NWA had now lost the writer of the group. The year is 1990 and Ice Cube went to New York to start his solo career and in that same year he would release America's Most Wanted which blew up and started making waves. America's Most Wanted debuted at number 19 on the US Billboard 200 and went gold. After witnessing Ice Cube's solo success, NWA began to grow envious of his success and also felt like he betrayed them for leaving the group. This led to NWA dissing him on their 1990 EP 100 Miles and Running with the lyrics, started with 5 but yo one couldn't take it, so now it's 4 cause the 5th couldn't make it. In addition, they called him Benedict Arnold. Now Benedict Arnold was an early hero of the Revolutionary War who later became one of the most infamous traitors in US history. Ice Cube would obviously catch wind of this and return fire against his former friends with the famous hit No Vaseline, which is considered one of the best rap diss songs of all time. In the song, Ice Cube completely eradicates each member one by one, including NWA manager Jerry Heller, claiming that NWA let a white Jew come in between them, scam them and break up the whole crew. He also directly replied to the 100 miles and running this by saying, I started off with too much car go drop four niggas now making no the dough. He continues by saying, you don't run 100 miles but you still got one to go. With the L-E-N-C-H-M-O-B and y'all disgrace the C-P-T. 
Cause you're getting f***ed out your green by a white boy <laughs> With no Vaseline Sheesh And that's not all of it But unfortunately I can't even play the song too tough Because of copyright But yeah and WA never replied to no Vaseline Anyway, the beef continued to escalate between the lynch mob, which was Ice Cube Entourage, and N.W.A. as the crews continued to fight each other. Things got even worse for Dr. Dre when Fox Television personality Dee Barnes entered the picture with her show Pump It Up. An episode of the show combined interviews with N.W.A. and Ice Cube shortly after N.W.A. had dissed Ice Cube in their 100 Miles and Running album. D Barnes said later on that there was a bad energy in the interview with NWA and every answer seemed to involve the diss towards Ice Cube. In production, this was then combined with Barnes' separate interview with Ice Cube in which he dissed NWA and also cruelly mimicked the voice of DOC shortly after a near fatal accident. This caused great offence to Dr Dre who was a close friend of the DOC. The production team at Fox wanted to combine the two interviews to stir up controversy and add flames to the fire in the beef between NWA and Ice Cube because they knew it would result in more ratings for the show. So this was just typical media just being messy. On the 27th of January 1991, a drunken Dr. Dre encountered Barnes at a record release party in Hollywood. According to Barnes, he picked her up by the hair and began slamming her head in the right side of her body repeatedly against a brick wall near the stairway as his bodyguard held off the crowd with a gun. After Dr. Dre tried to throw her down the stairs and failed, he began kicking her in the ribs and hands. She escaped and ran into the women's restroom and Dr. Dre followed her and grabbed her from behind by the hair and again proceeded to punch her in the back of the head. Sheesh. Finally, Dr. Dre and his bodyguard then ran from the building. Mind you, Dr. Dre did all of this because he was pissed at the fact that D. Barnes interviewed Ice Cube and allowed him to diss NWA and the DOC on the show, but there was nothing she could do. I mean, she was just doing her job. She was like 21 or 22 years old at the time. She wasn't in control of anything. She wasn't calling no shots. So the producers are the ones responsible for this. Anyways, in February, D. Barnes filed assault charges and brought a 22 million lawsuit against Dr. Dre, who pleaded no contest to the assault. He was fined $2,500, placed on two years probation and ordered to perform 240 hours of community service and also produce an anti-violence public service announcement. The lawsuit was then settled out of court. By 1991, N.W.A. released their second and final album, Niggas For Life. The album was praised by its critics for its improved production in comparison to the last album, but criticised some of its content. The album went on to top the Billboard 200, becoming the first album by a rap group to top the chart. By this time, Dr. Dre began to suspect that he was also not being properly compensated for all the hard work he's been putting into the N.W.A. projects. So what he did was confiding in the DOC about his suspicions. The DOC then pointed Dr. Dre in Suge Knight's direction, who had been hovering over in WA for a while by this point. Suge Knight then took Dr. Dre's contract to his friend Dick Griffey of Solo Records to look over the contracts and it was discovered that Dr. Dre was also getting ripped off but because of his six year contract on the Ruthless Records, he couldn't leave the label. Through beatdowns and threats to Easy e and Jerry Heller, Suge Knight was able to get Easy e to release Dr. Dre from the contract, but Easy e would still make a portion of the profits of anything Dr. Dre would release from that point onwards. I guess Dre Day really meant Easy's payday after all. Realising that Suge Knight was a problem, Easy e had thoughts about murdering Suge Knight, but Jerry Heller talked him out of it, stating that it would just put their business in jeopardy and that they were making $10 million a year and you know it just wouldn't be worth it. So with Ice Cube and Dr. Dre gone, NWA was dead and done for good. With Dr. Dre now being a free man, himself and Suge Knight founded Death Row Records in 1992. Dre released his first single under the new label, the title track of the film Deep Cover, a collaboration with a 21-year-old Snoop Dogg, whom he met through Dr. Dre's stepbrother Warren G. 
Dr. Dre's debut solo album was The Chronic, an album that's considered a classic to this day. Dr. Dre ushered in a new style of rap, both in terms of musical style and lyrical content, introducing a number of artists to the industry including Snoop Dogg, Corrupt, Daz Dillinger, Lady of Rage, Nate Dogg and Jewel. On the strength of singles such as Nothing But A G Thang, Let Me Ride and F With Dre Day, The Chronic became a cultural phenomenon. It's G-Funk sound dominating much of hip-hop music for the early 90s. By 1993, The Chronic went triple platinum and Dr. Dre also won the Grammy Award for Best Rap Solo Performance for his performance on Let Me Ride. Oof. During this time, a beef between Dr. Dre and Easy e would spark, with Dre and Snoop Dogg dissing Easy e on Dre Day and Easy e firing back with real MFGs, which absolutely slaps. That song is so hard. I love Easy es verses on that. It's definitely one of my favorites from Easy e <laughs> In the song, he makes fun of Dr. Dre's fashion sense back in his world-class wrecking crew days and also made it known to everyone that Easy e was still making money off of Dr. Dre's releases. Amidst the beef, the buzz that The Chronic received and with Snoop Dogg being in 90% of that album, Snoop Dogg had enough buzz to release his first album. So Dr. Dre got to work and produce Snoop Dogg's first album, Doggy Style, which which was released in November of 1993. Doggy Style debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and sold 806,000 copies in its first week alone in the United States. In 1995, he reunited with fellow and former NWA member Ice Cube to collaborate on the absolute banger Natural Born Killers. That is so. Uh, Bro, that is a tune fam, that is a tune, that is so hard, that song gets me hyped every time, I actually use it at the gym sometimes to literally push me further when I have a few more reps left, so therefore recommend that song for the gym for sure, for all my gym goers. Anyway, for the film Friday, Dr. Dre recorded Keep Their Heads Ringing, which reached number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 1 on the Hot Rap Singles charts. While all this was going on, Easy e would eventually pass away from AIDS in 1995, but by this time, Dr. Dre, Ice Cube and Easy e had luckily made up and talked about possibilities of bringing back NWA. Unfortunately, that would never happen. Dr. Dre had been paying tributes to his friend on several songs after that, including The Message, What's the Difference and Talking to My Diary. In late 1995, Death Row Records signed Tupac and began to position him as the major star. He collaborated with Dr. Dre on the commercially successful single California Love. However, in March of 1996, Dr. Dre left the label amidst a contract dispute and growing concerns that the label boss, Suge Knight, was corrupt, financially dishonest and out of control. Suge Knight began to treat Death Row Records like a gang member's playground, with blood hanging around the studio, beating people up and shooting dice in the premises. Dr. Dre became very unhappy with the environment as a whole, especially after he witnessed an engineer getting beat up for rewinding the tape too far back. <laughs> That's just insane, man. With all the East Coast and West Coast beef drama and the violence around him, Dr. Dre smartly decided to leave the label with nothing and start his own empire. Once again, the controversial album, The Slim Shady LP, released in 1999, the Dr. Dre produced lead single from the album, My Name Is, brought Eminem public on 83,000 copies in its first week. Dr. Dre's second solo album, 2001, released on November 16th, 1999. The album was considered a sequel to The Chronic and saw Dr. Dre return to his gangster rap roots. 2001 contained popular singles such as Still Dre, Forgot About Dre and The Next Episode. The album debuted at number 2 on the Billboard 200 with first week sales of 516,000 copies. 
In 1999, Dre would work on Eminem's second album with him, the Marshall Mavis LP, which would be released in May of 2000. That album went absolutely crazy and to be honest, the album made it among the fastest selling studio albums in the United States. With all these successful releases coming out of Aftermath Entertainment, things were just looking good for Dr. Dre and he decided to focus more on production. In 2002, Queen's rapper 50 Cent signed to Aftermath by Dr. Dre after signing to Interscope through Eminem's Shady Records. 50 Cent's major label debut album, Get Rich or Die Trying, was released on the 6th of February 2003 through Interscope, Shady and Aftermath. Get Rich or Die Trying featured production from Dr. Dre who also executive produced the album and added production by Eminem. Highly anticipated, the album debuted at number 1 on the Billboard Top 200, selling 872,000 copies in its first week. The album went on to be certified 9 times platinum in America by 2020. The Game, who also signed with the label in 2003, also released his debut album, The Documentary, through a joint venture with G-Unit Records in 2005. Shortly after the release of the documentary, tension between The Game and 50 Cent ignited, resulting in The Game leaving Aftermath in 2006. In 2012, Kendrick Lamar also signed with Aftermath, so as you can see, Dr. Dre was responsible for the careers of a lot of people. Just an absolute legend in my book. chess man in hip-hop, Dr. Dre became an Apple employee in an executive role. On August 1st, 2015, Dre announced that he would release what would be his final album, titled Compton. It is inspired by the NWA biopic Straight Out of Compton and is a compilation style album featuring a number of frequent collaborators including Eminem, Snoop Dogg, Kendrick Lamar, Exhibit and The Game amongst others. Dr. Dre's wife, Nicole Young, also filed for divorce in June of 2020, citing irreconcilable differences. Nicole initially requested 2 million in spousal support, but the judge dismissed the request. The divorce ended with Dre keeping most of his assets and income due to his prenup agreement, although he would have to pay a nine-figure settlement within a year. And that is it on this week's episode of Throwback Central. I hope you guys liked the video. Please don't forget to leave a thumbs up, comment, share and subscribe to this channel for more videos. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace.